I wish I could remember how they looked. Timmy, Jessica, and Jason, the children of the 10th floor. The ones I think about every time I step foot on a stage to perform. I try to see Timmy beyond the web of carefully coiled bandages that obscure the massive head wound doctors made days earlier when they removed a tumor from his brain, giving Timmy many more deserved years of life. I see Timmy as he scoots out from under the covers of his hospital bed on the 10th floor of Beth Israel North Hospital, about partway through my best acapella rendition of Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. Thank you. 
try to lead them to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what was Timmy doing just days after surgery? His hands began tracing J's in the air as he conducted the rest of the piece, his first gig. The giggling and clapping that followed were enough to keep me playing for the children of the 10th floor for the next 12 years. I can't remember Jessica's face, obscured as it was by wires and tubes and machinery that breathed and pulsed for her, but she too was a presence in my life. I had returned to the 10th floor for a spring performance, and every ambulatory child in the ward was there. Tucked away in the back of the room, contorted and motionless in her wheelchair, was Jessica. I began with some blues. Suddenly, alarms and beepers went off. Two residents and a nurse pushed through the other children to the back of the room. It was Jessica, and she had moved for the first time since her surgery. How can I explain to you how extraordinary this moment felt to me? I continued playing amidst the tremendous joy. When I was seven years old, I was a passionate idealist. Some things don't change. I had uh, read every word of Dr. Fred Epstein's autobiography, one of the greatest pediatric neurosurgeons in the world, and felt compelled to meet him. So I wrote him a handwritten letter, and it began, Dear Dr. Epstein, my name is Jordan Urbach. I'm seven years old, a devoted student of neuroscience, and a concert <laughs> violinist. You laugh, but he called. Well, a two-hour interview and a tour of the ICU later, I turned around to Dr. Epstein and announced my intention to help his kids. Music was the only tool I had at that age, so Children Helping Children was born. It was around this time that I met Jason. Jason touched me in a very different way. He was 13 and suffered from recalcitrant spinal tumors. He was always in and out of the hospital. Jason was a pianist and felt sick inside about not being able to practice while he was on the ward. I decided to change that. By spring, I'd figured out how. I would throw a benefit concert. So I produced Children Helping Children's first concert for a cure in my high school auditorium. And in spring of 1999, Dr. Epstein, my mentor and my friend, walked into my high school with 50 members of his esteemed staff and joined the sold out house to buy Jason and the rest of the kids on the 10th floor a piano. The event spoke volumes to me. When a child believes, anything is possible. We raised that money, got the ward the piano, and had enough left over to start a surgery fund to bring disenfranchised children from around the world to Beth Israel Hospital to experience the world-class care that only they could provide. Now, Jason lost his battle with brain cancer a year later. But this is not a sad story. 
In fact, it's one of the happiest ones I know. Because when I was seven years old, Jason and the children of the 10th floor taught me to think bigger, harder, and more compassionately. They inspired me to turn children helping children from an organization into a movement in medicine and music. Hundreds of in-hospital performances, dozens of galas at Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center, and $4.7 million later, Children Helping Children has fundamentally changed the way the international medical community raises funds. Through Concerts for a Cure that I've produced and headlined at venues across the US, we have been able to provide 12 disenfranchised kids with life-saving brain surgeries, 1,000 cochlear implants for indigent kids who couldn't hear, hundreds of thousands of dollars of aid to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's research and services, and raised the media profile of dozens of other neurologically focused organizations through our national media campaigns. And I'm proud to say that Children Helping Children currently funds the largest music therapy program in America at the University of Michigan Mott Children's Hospital, serving 5,000 young inpatients a year. Thank you. Thank you. We as human beings are driven by the very simple belief that whatever it is that we do holds the utmost importance. But it's not what we do. It's what we inspire in others that holds the real value. Now, in a worldwide effort through Children Helping Children, hundreds of musicians around the world, from America to Australia, are donating their talents, producing their own concerts for a cure. They are changing the world and inspiring patrons to flock to concert halls in support of them, and thus in support of the future of healthcare. So let us inspire a global evolution in healthcare. Let us use our talents in the name of social action. Let us celebrate our shared beauty and let us resolve bravely, stubbornly, and spiritedly to play on. We do this as musicians. Now we must do this as social entrepreneurs. I can't always remember their features or the color of their eyes, but they are a presence, the children of the 10th floor. In every overture, in the first bow I take, and in the last kiss to the balcony. They made me the young leader I am today and showed me that kids can move small mountains with big hearts. I owe them mine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.